Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. You're the one, it's Christ in me. song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Good morning and welcome to online worship with Central Baptist Church of Crandall, Texas. We're so glad that you joined with us today. And if you're new, we hope you'll indicate that by typing I'm new in the comment box below and someone will send you an online greeting and express our appreciation that you join with us today. On behalf of the staff of Central Baptist Church, uh, we want to wish you a happy new year. I'm sure we're all, we're all glad to see the year 2020 in the rearview mirror and we're hoping and praying that the year 2021 will be much more prosperous and happy and healthy and normal. That's what we're hoping and praying for, isn't it? In the way of announcements, we just want to tell you that on Wednesday night, January the 6th, uh, we'll resume our normal Wednesday night uh, program. Uh, we'll be having uh, the Wednesday night Bible study, the children's activities, Everything will be going on as normal, and we encourage everyone to uh, come out as we resume our Wednesday night program. Of course, we appreciate uh, the faithful giving that our members uh, demonstrated during the year 2020, and the way we give has not changed. You can give through the uh, online app. Uh, you can give through the church website. You can mail your gift in. You can drop it by the church or if needs be, we'll be glad to dispatch someone to your home to pick it up. 
But God loves a cheerful and faithful giver, and we trust all of our members will commit themselves to doing that in the year 2021. Now let's pause and pray and dedicate this service to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new year. And Lord, we look forward to this new year, and Lord, we pray for a better health in our country, more stability in our country. Lord, we just pray that you'll prosper our church in this coming year. Help us all, Lord, to dedicate ourselves to serving you with more fervor and, and more enthusiasm in this new year. Lord, we just pray that you'll bless the service this morning and may be an inspiration uh, to all those who view it. And th this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard and to hear what you would say. Word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know you're in this place, please let me stay and rest in your holiness, Word God speak, word of God speak, I'm finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be with you and to hear what you would say hey, where do God speak would you pour down like rain washing my eyes to see oh your majesty to be still and know you're in this place let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. Would you pour down my rain, washing my eyes to see oh, your majesty, to be still and know you're in this place. Please let me stay. In your holiness, word of God speak, word of God speak, I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. Good morning. Welcome today. Praise the Lord for this uh, opportunity to get together and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're in a series. I really begin on Christmas Eve <clears throat> talking about uh, ministering unto the Lord. And uh, that's, that statement has captured my mind and heart over the last years. And I've been praying for God to help me to know what that meant, how I can do that. But certainly that's what I want for us. That's what I want for our church. Last week we talked about the beautiful church at Antioch and how uh, that God worked through them to begin uh, touching our world through missions. And I pray that God will do that for us as well here in this place 
I would like to open our Bibles today to Luke chapter 4. You know, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. We just celebrated the fact that uh, Jesus Christ is who he said he was and did what he said that he would do. We celebrated his birthday. He is the Messiah. Uh, but even though he was a Messiah, Jesus modeled life for us. Uh, for example, uh, when Jesus was a child, he was brought to the temple and dedicated unto the Lord. And they, we have that great uh, picture of dedication. We dedicate children to the Lord. And then uh, when he began his public ministry, he was publicly baptized as a uh, witness, as a testimony, as a model to us about what we are supposed to do. And so I, I hope that we're following the model of Christ because that's exactly what I'm talking about today. If I want to really minister to the Lord, uh, I was asking myself, where could I find the greatest example of that so that I could follow that example? Well, I believe Jesus Christ is that greatest example. Uh, Jesus, uh, in our previous chapters, chapter uh, 3 and now 4, uh, Jesus faced temptation and gave us a model as to how we can deal with uh, temptation in our own life. And uh, in the first year of his ministry, he had begun to model uh, what his life was to be about. And when we come to chapter 4, uh, and beginning at uh, verse 14, uh, we'll find our text for today. And today uh, we look at Jesus ministering unto the Father and how that can be an example for us. And uh, here's the text we want to read, verse 16. So he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where uh, he had been brought up. As you know, his uh, ministry in Galilee was headed out of Capernaum, but now he's going back to Nazareth. And the, listen to this. And his custom was, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue <clears throat> on the Sabbath day and he stood up and read. And uh, I, I think that's another model of Christ to follow. You know, some people have the idea, hey, if I get to church, uh, you know, one time a month or especially on the special days, I go to Christmas Eve service and Easter service, perhaps that's, a, that's good enough. Well, the model that Christ said is that it was his custom every week on the Sabbath to be uh, in the synagogue. <clears throat> uh, verse 17, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And here was a great promise of God to Israel. And here was going to be the work of the Messiah. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And to send me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to recover the sight of the blind. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and he gave it to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That was a great, great testimony of Christ saying, I am the Messiah. This, this text was about the Messiah and what he was going to do. And Jesus said uh, that I am him. I'm the Messiah. And I believe just as uh, he was a model for everything else, he begins to tell us, and we'll see as we end up this text today, how that uh, one of the ways that we minister unto the Lord is just to involve ourselves in the things that Jesus Christ was involved in. And Jesus came to help people. He know, he, we note five kinds of people that he came to help, if you'll look in your text. Number one, uh, he said, I came to help the poor. And uh, we could say those who do not have what they need in life. When I think about poverty, I think there are several kinds of poverty. Uh, there is material poverty uh, when people have, simply don't have any money. We don't really understand that in this world in which we live in, the culture of this beautiful country that God has allowed us to live in, the United States of America. 
But can I tell you that we are rich beyond measure, beyond most of the world. As a matter of fact, the poorest of the poor in this country is rich compared to 90% of the world in which we live in. Half of our world population lives on less than $3 a day. Can you imagine that? 3.5 billion people live or try to live on less than $3 a day. Over 1 billion live on less than a dollar a day. Now, I thank God uh, that I don't have to face that every day of my life, but I'm just telling you that's the reality in our world. Uh, material poverty is a problem in this world. Uh, you take uh, people who grow coffee in Honduras and, uh, uh, and even in Africa and uh, some of the African countries who uh, spend their whole day working uh, so that we can have coffee, who for a day's pay could not go in Starbucks and order a cup of coffee. And yet they're the ones who grow and harvest the coffee and make it possible for our country to enjoy it. Well, I want to tell you, material poverty is a real problem. And the Bible says the Messiah came uh, to address those who were in material poverty. But then there's another kind of poverty, I think, that's uh, in our world. Uh, there is the moral pro poverty. Uh, people who literally have or seem to have, at least to me, no moral conscience. They, they have no moral compass, uh, compass in their life. They, they don't care what's right or wrong. All they care is, will it get me what I want? Very pragmatic in their thinking. Morally, they are uh, totally uh, in poverty. And then there is spiritual poverty. Uh, knowing God's plan and purpose for my life uh, is a reality for me that I enjoy. But for many in our world, for many in our country, uh, they have no uh, idea about God's plan and purpose for their life. They live in spiritual darkness, in poverty. Jesus spent most, I would say the majority of his time, not dealing uh, with those who are... Uh, Materially in poverty, but those who are in spiritual poverty. And I think uh, as, as a church, as we launch out in this new year, that we ought to be about what God was about through the Messiah. Spiritual poverty. While half the world's population is spiritually destitute, they don't know that they are uh, more than an accident that's in this world. That, that they were made for a purpose, that they're going to have an afterlife that's going to be more real than the life that they're living here in this lifetime. Jesus came to die in their place. They don't know that. And that, that they're, they're infinitely loved by God. Uh, that's who Jesus came to minister to. That's who the Messiah came to minister to. And then the Messiah came for the brokenhearted, uh, those who are let down in life and disappointed. Uh, the Bible says uh, in Psalms, and I think David gives a great description of those who are brokenhearted. He says, reproach or insult, some translation says, has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I've looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. And I'm telling you, our world is filled with people who have a broken hearted. Uh, you know, that word broken heart is really a biblical term. And we have it in the Bible. Uh, the Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted. Do you know it's a real thing, being brokenhearted? I know sometimes people just say, well, uh, I'm just brokenhearted. But brokenheartedness is a real thing. As a matter of fact, uh, every psychologist uh, in their studies uh, are reminded of a physical reality called the brokenhearted syndrome. And uh, it's a real thing that, that our, uh, our brain uh, releases chemicals that actually weaken the tissue around our heart physically. It's a real deal. Somebody says, stress will kill you. I want to tell you that is a true statement. We're living in a world that's brokenhearted. It's caused by many things. Things that people hope for that don't turn out the way that they had hoped and dreamed and planned disappointments that come into our life. 
Uh, maybe the greatest of all is uh, rejection by somebody that we, we love. Or resentment. <clears throat> we hold on to our hurts. And it's like a poison that we're holding on to. And it's, it's literally uh, poisoning not just our mind, but our, our physical being and our spiritual being. And so he said, uh, I've come uh, for those who are poor. I've come for those who are brokenhearted. I've come for those who are captive, those, those who have lost their freedom. Now, of course, uh, prison is a reality. In this country, more than uh, three million men and women are incarcerated in this country in which we live in. But I don't think Jesus was really referring to those who were in prison. Certainly there was prisons in the day of Jesus. But he was talking about people who had uh, lost their freedom. Who were in prison by many times a prison of their own making. Can I suggest some people that uh, possibly uh, he's talking about. And we can relate to in our land. People who are uh, caught up in addictions and compulsions. And, and we hear often from somebody who says, I just feel trapped in a situation. They are, they are controlled by their hurts and their habits and their hang-ups. And uh, things they want to change in their life, but they can't change. And so that's a prison uh, that people find themselves in. Can I tell you another prison that we have? Uh, ignorance. Did you know that uh, I was shocked when I read this a few weeks ago, that half of our world's population cannot read. They have, they have little or no education. And it's interesting that almost uh, uh, all the schools and hospitals that originally started were started by Christians because we realized that what Jesus was to be about, we're supposed to be about. That's a real prison. But then I, I can tell you there's another prison, and that's holding secrets. Uh, and we are imprisoned by the secrets. We're afraid we're going to be found out or uh, we're letting their control our life. Uh, it's been uh, said, and I believe it, revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. And then there is the prison of fears. Uh, underneath all anger is fear. So if you're angry and continually angry, ask yourself this question, what am I afraid of? We're talking now about people that are, have lost their freedom. They have become uh, prisoners many times by their own making. And then he said he came for the blind, uh, those who are just uh, shut out of life. And of course, literally there are blind, and Jesus did deal with people who are blind. We have many accounts where Jesus actually healed the blind. Uh, but uh, there are physically blind people that we ought to pray for in our world. It is a huge deal. Uh, I thank God in this country they, are, they have more resources than ever that enable them to uh, live a, a life, but, but there's, there's stages of blindness. I mean, I talk about uh, people who are colorblind or uh, people who have night blindness, but there, that's not the only kind of blindness there is. There is relational blindness. There, uh, there are those who, who don't see how that they, their destructive behavior is destroying relationships that they're in. And then there is, of course, I believe the focus of Jesus' ministry is those who are spiritually blind. Blind to their spiritual birthright. Blind to the gospel, the Bible says. Uh, attributing all the things that are good uh, in their life to, to themselves and all the things that are bad in their life uh, to God. Blinded to how much God loves them. And that's a tragedy in our land. And then he said uh, he came for the oppressed. Uh, those who are uh, uh, beat down uh, in this life. Because of other people in this life. Uh, we could say it like this. There, there are, are, are several kinds of people are oppressed. There is of course uh, political oppression. That's been a reality in this world. And continues to be so in this day. Uh, I was shocked to read this. Listen to this. 38 million people today live in refugee camps. Not for a week and not for a month and not for a year. But sometimes beyond decades because uh, uprisings in their country politically has exiled them and not allowed to even go back to, the, to their country. But here's the thing that got me more than, than uh, the political blindness and, and uh, uh, oppression, and that is 
the cultural oppression that we live in. For example, did you know that in this world today, there are more people who are slaves than there were 150, 175 years ago? You say, well, we're in the world of slaves. We, we fought a war over that and... Uh, you know, we value human rights and, and we don't have slavery in this country anymore. Well, I want to tell you this, in this country and in this world, it is a reality. And the greatest slavery in this country is sexual trade, sex slaves. Uh, interesting statistics uh, that I have. The number one thing that is holding people in slavery today is sexual trade. Two million girls every year from the age of 5 to 15 are enslaved to sexual trade. Listen to that again. Two million girls in Asia and in India. It's, it's unbelievable. I'm told by an authority that I personally know that Dallas... In this country is a hub for sexual trafficking. I want to know where is the uh, people who are fighting to free people from slavery today. But I'm telling you it's a reality in our world today. Because you can make laws but that doesn't change people's heart. Uh, cultural oppression. Uh, some religions, men have the right to murder their wife, it's called uh, uh, murder. Uh, honoring uh, honoring the the uh, Quran allows them to, uh, if if their wife has dishonored them some way, that they can take their life. That's a reality in our world today. But of course, the greatest oppression is satanic oppression, and I can tell you that's a reality. And you don't have to be a lost person to have satanic oppression upon your life. Listen to what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus says, uh, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'm telling you, I'm amazed how blind we are in this world. We think that because the economy is up and uh, the government is printing money and giving out to those who are, are, are struggling, and you know, I'm not opposed to helping people that are struggling, that, that we're beyond all the things that Jesus come to do. I'm telling you, we're in the thick of it. It is needed more today than it's ever been needed in this world. In 1 John chapter uh, 2, verse 11, the Bible says, He who hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness... And does not know where he's going because of the darkness has blinded him. In our country, there is, uh, there is a, a uh, cultural revolution today where hatred is poured out on the streets. Where, where literally men and women hate one another. Even some Christians joining in these, uh, these riots and things. Uh, and okaying it because uh, of, of how I interpret what's going on in this land. The Bible says, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going. And I, that's the mindless crowds I see in the streets in their empty protest. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, If our gospel is, is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, those whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. I want to tell you, my friend, I don't know if this country has ever been as spiritually blind as it is in this very day. Blinded to the gospel. As a matter of fact, the gospel is becoming a subject of hatred in the very land that you and I live in. And then he came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, this is, this is uh, the sixth thing that uh, the Messiah was to do. Now, I think that's important. Jesus came to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the favor of the Lord. 
The year of the favor of the Lord. What is that? Well, it was a divine law of God. It's also referred to in the Bible as the year of Jubilee. And it had to do with the land. God said uh, to Israel uh, that uh, on the Sabbath day, uh, he wants the people to rest. But on the Sabbath year, seven years, that they were to let the land rest. It was called the year of the Jubilee and several things was going to happen. Uh, on the year of Jubilee, on that, 49, on that 50th year, uh, all debt was to be canceled. Everyone in prison for debt was to be released. Uh, all endanger, indentured servants were to be given their freedom, and the land was to be returned to its rightful owner. Now, you see, God was not just saying, I want to help people that obviously have needs, but I, I want you to do some things because it's best for you, for everyone concerned. And it was a sabbatical year. Now, God wanted us to understand that while we live in this world, this world is not ours. Who does this world belong to? I want to tell you this world is God's. And history is not your story, not my story. It's God's story. And uh, he taught this to us. As a matter of fact, uh, we know that life is a trust, life is a test. And life is a temporary assignment. Our, our eternal life is not about this life. This is just uh, uh, getting us ready for eternity. Uh, he taught it with a tree in Garden of uh, Eden. Uh, he said, there's one tree you can't touch. Uh, doesn't say he didn't touch. Couldn't eat of its fruit. And uh, it, it, he said, uh, I just want you to know that while you have free run of this garden, uh, it's not yours. This world's not yours. It's mine. And you belong to me. He taught it with a day. He said, your time's not yours. On this seventh uh, day, I want you to set it aside as a day of rest and to reflect upon who I am and what I, what I mean to you. And then he taught it with a tithe. He said, uh, I don't want you to think that you own anything, that you're stewards in this land. And as a reminder of that, uh, I want you to tithe. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says that we are to tithe to teach us to put God first place in our life. We understand it's not ours, it's God's. And then uh, he taught it uh, in, a, in a year. Uh, the land was to be at rest. Now, why did God set it up this way? Well, God wanted us to know that his favor and his blessing is, con uh, uh, is, is conditional. Uh, we have God's favor and God's blessing in our li life contingent upon the fact that we will obey him. Because uh, every, every one of the promises, or at least most of the promises in the Bible, uh, have a premise to them. Uh, there's a condition to them. And God wants us to remember uh, what God has done for us. And he wants people to know that, that they own nothing, that, that we are stewards uh, in this land. And, and everything that we think we have, we really don't own. It's on loan from God. God gives us a choice. And the choice has a consequence. Now listen to this. Not one time as, as Israel going into the land, the promised land, did they obey this command. 490 years. And the Bible says, Jeremiah the prophet said, that they were going to be carried away into captivity for 70 years. Now listen to this. That's one year for every sabbatical year that they ignored. My friend, I want, to, I want you to understand that there are consequences. Now, in, in the midst of all of this, that I've tried to explain the condition of, our, of the world in Christ's day, very similar uh, to the condition of our world today. Isaiah gives this prophecy of the coming Messiah in Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus, going into the synagogue, reads this passage in Isaiah and says, I am the Messiah. I've come to do this. And now listen to me. If this was the mission of Christ as the Messiah, it's the mission of the church. We're to be involved in the work that Jesus was involved in. The Bible says in John chapter 13, Jesus said, 
I've given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done. I was just thinking when I was overwhelmed with this message and uh, the theme this year, ministering unto the Lord. How, what does that mean? How are we going to do it? Last year, uh, we, uh, out of Acts chapter 20, uh, bought into our vision for this uh, decade is to uh, uh, be all in, not hold anything back. That we're going to be a servant leaders, faithful witnesses, faithful to finish the race that God has set before us. Faithful to protect the flock. Faithful to be students of God's word. Faithful givers of God's tithes and offerings. And faithful to pray. Now listen, I'm saying to you that if we really mean that, then we're going to be accomplishing it. Say, all right, Brother Charlie, you've got me all confused. Well, I've got myself confused. Uh, I've tried to struggle through this, but, but let me make it simple as we close. What Jesus came to do, we are to be doing. And if we're doing what Jesus came to do, we're going to be ministering unto the Lord. What does that look like in real life then? What does it look like? Well, I can't do all these things. I've been thinking about how I can do them and how the church can do it. Some uh, other staff came and said, Brother Charlie, listen, we, you can't do everything and we can't do everything, but we can all get together and we can do some things and, and we can seek to do as best we can at those things. Let me suggest some things. Number one, we are to preach the good news. That's the first thing that Jesus said he, he was about to do. How do you do that? I'm not a called preacher. You might even say, well, Brother Charlie, you're not even good at it yourself. But here's what we can do. We can, everyone, tell our story. I love to tell my story. Hallelujah. <laughs> I remember it as if it was yesterday. I know that it's been years and years ago. But I tell you, I remember it uh, the, the night on a Sunday night when Jesus Christ gave me birth into the kingdom of God. And I can tell that story. And that's my story. You know, First uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 15 uh, Peter gives us these instructions. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that you have with meekness and fear. Uh, you have a story. Tell your story. That's the great news. Amen. That's the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. As uh, I've stole for Rick Warren. Uh, your past forgiven, a purpose for living, a home in heaven. I'm telling you, what, what better news is there in all of life? Think about your guilt gone. Think about a reason for living. Think about the hope that this isn't all there is, that heaven is, is a future. Heaven is real. Eternity is real. Who is going to be in heaven because you took the Great Commission seriously in your life? Jesus took it serious. That was what his life was about. Yes, he did. Uh, heal some blind people. And yes, he did uh, help sustain some people that were poor. Yes, he did reach out and touch. But I'm telling you, my friend, what he really was about was about getting people ready for heaven, about meeting needs in their life that were spiritual needs in their life. Because I want to tell you, my friend, you can have every physical need in this world met and still die and go to hell and you'll be miserable for an eternity. Now, that's not even a good word, miserable. It's beyond that. Whose name... Do you need to write down? We, we talk about our four by fours all the time. Cards with four people's names. Who, who, who's your one? <laughs> Somebody that you know that doesn't, uh, uh, haven't received the gospel, has, doesn't have heaven as their uh, eternal spiritual address. Who is that in your life? Pray for them. Tell the good news. Tell the, the great news of your story to them. And then cover the hurting. Heal the head and wounds. Heal the brokenhearted. I want to tell you they're brokenhearted people right uh, in your world right now. I'm looking at this, this great beautiful sanctuary. And I know every Sunday there are people that are coming in. Their hearts are broken. And can I tell you honestly that many times that heart is my heart. And that's heart, the heart of my wife. 
I'm telling you, there are brokenhearted people all around you. Uh, comfort the hurting. Uh, heal heal the, the head and wounds. How do you know them? Well, I, I'm not sure that I know who is that. Okay, let me give you a good way to find uh, the brokenhearted. Hurting people hurt people. Who's hurting you in your life? I want to tell you that's somebody probably with a broken heart. That's what hurting people do. They, they hurt people. Try to have a, an understanding about where they're coming from, where their hurts are. We, as believers, are in the people business. I, I talk to the staff about it all the time. Uh, if you're not in the people business, we're going to be out of business. Listen, man, it's about people. People. Uh, we have to have the ministry. I say, You say, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to help the brokenhearted. I'm telling you, man, there's sometimes when my heart is so broken, I don't need anybody to come and tell me anything at all. I just need to know that they're there. They care. They love me. There is such thing as the ministry of presence, just being present in the people's lives. That are, they, you can't give them an explanation that's going to change anything. You can't really even change anything, but you can be there with them, and that's what they need more than they need anything else. It's not what we say. Can you have the ministry of presence of somebody in your life? Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. It's what we've always said. Who can you talk to? Allow them to talk to you and just, just pour out the hurt that's in their life. Man, when somebody comes and says, Brother Charlie, I've never told anybody what I'm telling you right now. I, I can almost begin to see healing starting to take place in their life. Because we have to talk about it. Who is someone in your world that is hurting and you know they're hurting that you just need to have the ministry of presence with? The ministry of presence. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16, I will, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked paths straight. These things I will do for them and I will not forsake them. Boy, sometimes you just show up with a verse like that. I can't tell you in one of the dark nights of my soul when a friend of mine shared this verse with me. He had no idea the powerful influence that was going to have in my life. But I've, I've held that verse tied to my heart ever since somebody had the ministry of presence and was willing to share that, that passion of the Word of God. It's not your great counseling abilities that's going to change. It's the fact that you're there and you give them the Word of God. Let me tell you something else. We're to restore those who feel trapped. He said the captive. Who is the captive? Well, those who feel trapped. Of course, there are people in prison. If you have people there, as I do, you can understand that uh, they need somebody to uh, reach out to them and, and uh, speak truth into them. But listen to me. There are many people that are captive by their past. And they're letting their past destroy their today and their future. There are people that are captives of loneliness. Especially in this day of the coronavirus. There are more lonely people in this country probably than it's ever been uh, number wise in the history of this country. There are people that are caught up and, and captive by circumstances that many times are beyond their control. He says, proclaim freedom to the captives. Give them the word of God. Give them the truth. Pray continually and become a way through which they will feel the presence of God. Focus on the fact that God loves uh, to help them to know. God loves them and they matter. They're not forgotten. Help them to move against their fear. I want to tell you, I learned this as a very young child who was terrified of the dark. That, that uh, I had to move against my fear. And having done that, it, it, it helped me break through that great fear that had captured my heart. Just as a child. But I understood I, I, I couldn't live like that anymore. Uh, this is called faith. You know, I, I was thinking about my dad when I was preparing this message. And talking about fear, he used to wear a, a, a cap uh, that had the acrostic fear. And here's what the cap said that he wore around. False evidence appearing real. I, can I tell you something about your fear and my fear? Our fears are greater than the reality almost every time. And yet we let the fear control us. We have to break through it. Now, who do you know that is trapped in the fear that 
need somebody to come alongside them and say, listen, uh, you're going to have to move against your fear. And when we move against it, we'll find that the, the reality of our fear is not nearly as great as the fear itself. And then we're to help the blind to see. Uh, he said, provide recovery of sight. You open the eyes of the blind by telling people the truth of the gospel. By uh, sharing with those who have never heard the gospel. And by living the gospel for those who have never seen the gospel. I'm telling there's so many people that have heard the gospel, heard the gospel. Their gospel hardened to their hearing. But when somebody comes out and lives the gospel before them, it is life transforming. We have the gospel in us, and we know it has changed our life, and we can live it out before others. And we have to tell them the truth. In this day of political correctness, it's not politically correct, but somebody needs to say them to them, here is the truth. There's not going to be any help in your life apart from the transformation that Jesus Christ himself can bring in your life, because Jesus Christ is the way that uh, he is the uh, the way, the life, and the truth. Listen, there's no other way to the Father except through Him. There's no other way. And you're not going to get better by uh, the idealistic ideas of the society and culture that we live in. That is set more and more against the truth of the gospel. You know, when you go to the doctor, a surgeon has to sometimes cut you open to bring healing. And sometimes the truth cuts, but it has to be said. And we can't walk away from it as many churches seem to be doing today. And then encourage those who are oppressed. He said, release the oppressed. Be a voice for those who have no voice. You say, I don't know them. Well, how about this? Be a voice for the unborn. I know in our, our staff, this seems to have gripped our heart with a new passion. 60, billion, 60 million children aborted. Since 1967 in this country and growing every, every day that I speak. Who's going to be a voice? They're, they're, who is the, uh, the person going to be against slavery? Who's going to be the voice for the people who have no voice? Be a voice. Uh, we, we are ministers to God, to caring people. Well, how is this ministering to the Lord? Well, let me read to you. As we close, how it's ministering into the Lord. These are the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25. He said, then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and tuck you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say unto you, insomuch as you did this to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. In that parable, Jesus helps us to understand that one of the greatest ways that we can minister to God is to minister to people. We're in the people business. It's not a program. It's supposed to be a lifestyle. I don't know of anyone that lived out this lifestyle besides the Lord Jesus Christ himself more than the Apostle Paul. And listen to what he said out of the New Living Translation, I'm reading 1 Corinthians 9, 19 and following. I have become a servant to everyone so that I can bring them to Christ. When I'm with those who follow the Jewish laws, I do the same, even though I'm not subject to the law, so I can bring them to Christ. When I'm with the Gentiles, I fit in with them as much as I can so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not discard the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are oppressed, 
I share their oppression so that I might bring them to Christ. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. In doing so, I enjoy his blessing. On this first Sunday of this great new year that God has given to us, may I say to you, dear church, join with me. Let's drill down deep into the model that Jesus I'm going to help us do that in these messages. We drill down deep. This is the overall message of the Messiah. This is what he said he came to do. If that was what he came to do, that's what we're to be about. And I'm, I, I'm calling upon you. I'm asking you to join us in this great vision of our 2020 vision for this decade. Oh, God, help us. Help us do the possible so that God might do the impossible in your life and in my life. Will you join me? Paul said, in doing this, I enjoy the blessing. There'll be no greater blessing for Central Baptist Church. There'll be no greater blessing for Charlie Wilson in this coming year than to minister unto the Lord following the model of Jesus Christ himself. I can't do everything for everybody, but I can do something about somebody in my life and in my world. I want to close with the priestly blessing of Aaron in the book of Numbers, chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. It's a powerful word of encouragement to you and to me as we take on this great task that is bigger than any of us. He said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Now listen to this. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Did you know that God is lifting up his countenance upon you? And he wants you to have peace. Peace that's able to keep your heart and your mind. In these confusing and troubled days, God bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. And may God bless you and give you peace.